Welcome to SitRep. This is the new podcast dedicated to modern miniature wargaming. My name's G. You might know me from my work on another miniatures wargaming website that's pretty popular around the world. During some conversations on some of the groups I belong to on Facebook, Modern Miniature Wargaming, Inspector Operations, Inspector Miniatures, some people were asking for a podcast because there was nothing really related to Modern Miniature Wargaming. So I thought I would take up the task. Other people seemed pretty receptive to the idea of there being a podcast related to miniatures wargaming in the modern era. Being a military veteran myself and having quite a few contacts within the world of the military, I thought this might be just the perfect project for me. So we're going to get started into this. This is episode one. We're going to try and do these about once a week, maybe every other week in the beginning, just to see how it goes and make sure we have enough good quality material. I just don't want to feel fill airspace for anybody. The idea behind the podcast is just to give you some background into many different game systems, new releases, any topics of discussion that might relate to modern miniature wargaming, uh, i.e. movies, and other events. Now, the only thing I ask is we want you to participate in these podcasts, but please, let's leave politics outside of it. If you are a uh, veteran or an active member of the military, you will know that when it comes down to it, politics doesn't belong. We have a mission, we achieve the mission, and then we go home. The ultimate goal of any soldier is to go home and to make sure their buddies go home as well. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. So to start off, let's talk about some new releases that have come out. One of them is from Spectre Miniatures. They have released their set of Humvees. Now there's the basic Humvee and then there's the up armored kits. So if you're not familiar with the Humvee, that's the all-terrain vehicle that the United States Army came out with in the late 70s, early 80s. I can tell you we got ours when I was with the 82nd in 87 when I first got to Fort Bragg. And we were getting our Humvees, and they had had them earlier. Obviously, they had them in Grenada, I believe. Um, I think that was around the time we started seeing them widespread. It was a, a really rugged vehicle. And it had many purposes. There was the ambulance configuration. There was a cargo configuration. You had your troop carrier configuration. You had the turtle back. That's the one with the sloping hardback shell. So those were meant to replace the old Willys Jeeps from World War II up through all its iterations through the Vietnam War and post-Vietnam War. Well, as we got into Desert Storm and then later into the Iraq and then Afghanistan campaigns, and we had the proliferation of IEDs, unfortunately we learned the hard way that Humvees weren't really survivable in those type of uh, encounters. So what you had was a lot of people mocking up Humvees to survive, and at least initially. So they were putting any metal plate they could find in the floor pans of the Humvees, um, their ballistic vests, when they had them, sandbags was a pretty popular one. Unfortunately, it still created a big issue of survivability of the vehicle and those within it. Then they decided to up armor the vehicles. And so they added the up armor, and I believe you can get that for Spectre Miniatures as well as an up armor kit. And that's all great, but it adds a lot of weight to your vehicle. Then when you have these up armor kits and they don't really like have the open doors or windows anymore because that was the only kind of ventilation you had at the time, they started putting in these military versions of air conditioning. Between the up armor, these air conditioning units, which were huge and bulky, and then the weapons systems, it became a problem with weight and power of the vehicle because these were diesel engines. And while they were somewhat powerful, they were never designed to carry all this weight, plus crew and weapons and your rucksacks and everything like that. So they had to look for another vehicle that not only had the power, but the survivability on the battlefield related to incoming rounds and IEDs especially. One of those that came up was the MRAP. 
This is a, a, a newer vehicle, um, more on a big truck chassis. Um, I think some of the other ones, you know, there's known from different militaries around the world, like the Cougar and some of these other ones. It was an up armored vehicle with a larger power chassis, and it was designed to survive uh, an IED and uh, more importantly, have your crew survive. Because anything in the military, anyone in the military will be able to tell you that the objective of combat is not truly to kill the other soldier, it is to wound them. Because when you kill a soldier, they can lay in the battlefield and be recovered after combat has moved past. When you wound a soldier, not only do you take that soldier out, but then you will also have to take out other personnel to recover that wounded soldier and get them off the battlefield and get them to help. So that was something that I found eye-opening when I went through basic training back in 1986. Um, so I'm looking at the Spectre Miniatures website right now at their Humvee and it's a beautiful model, the, the base one, and then you can get the uh, up armor doors. Um, you can see the several iterations of the up armor. Um, then they have the turtle back, and then it looks like they got the old crew compartment, which you know is basically a metal shell that went through the open cargo area that you could have uh, mount weapons to and carry things back there as well. Um, so it's an, a really nice kit. I've not gotten one yet myself but knowing some of the Spectre Miniatures other vehicles like the Razor which I have a couple of I got those last year at UK Games Expo when I talked to Steven um, it's a really nice kit so it's nice to see them expanding outside with some more military based vehicles I know that Spectre Miniatures and their game itself you know, it's more towards the spec ops side of things and less towards the traditional side of the military. So you had more of the uh, other type of vehicles, like, you know, your pickup trucks, so your technicals and those type of things and SUVs. So it's nice to see them going towards some of the vehicles that you would definitely see special forces using um, in the mountains and stuff like that. Now, a lot of them would use like the old Toyota pickups in the mountains it's basically whatever you could get your hands on that was reliable that's what you use especially if you were a, um, an alpha team working in the you know in the mountains and i'm referring to the u.s special forces um, and you're working with your counterparts within the country you use the vehicles that they have accessible um, which brings me to another thing i, I saw a comment somebody asked in one of the uh, groups why did spec ops or special ops wear a lot of civilian clothes? One of the reasons for that, it wasn't truly to be covert because let's be honest, if you're in Afghanistan or Iraq and you're a typical Anglo-Saxon, African-American, Hispanic, or whatever ethnic background, you're going to stand out from the people that live within that country. So you're not fooling anybody. So the whole covert thing isn't really there. One of the major reasons why you see a lot of these special ops people wearing civilian attire is because it's like your Columbia, your North Face, anything that's proven outdoor, high quality clothing. Because in a lot of areas, these guys don't get supplied with the t traditional uniforms um, as often as like a regular infantry unit would. Um, they're a little more relaxed in their attire because it helps them fit in with some of the groups that they're dealing with. Um, because, you know, you're there to help and advise and train these people. And part of that is to try and fit in and not be overbearingly militaristic. So that's one of the reasons, but one of the big reasons was because the civilian clothing that these guys were bringing in was much more practical and durable for them in their conditions that they were working in in the environment. Um, you would see a lot of equipment, especially in the big push during the Gulf War, the second one, that the Army started handing out Wiley X sunglasses and um, – 
a lot of commercial off the shelf like gloves and things. So you weren't getting the old leather shell with the the um, wool liners anymore. You were getting you know good patrol gloves and things like that that people were buying and bringing over anyways. And then the military started issuing that kind of things. They would get contracts with the suppliers and they would get um, items brought for the soldiers. So that's one of the reasons why you see a lot of the troops wearing civilian clothes. It was one to help them just kind of fit in to the environment. It was not truly to go covert. You were not covert because everybody knew you You were mixed in with the crowd. Uh, Another reason is you wore a lot of nondescript civilian type clothing because it made the enemy hard to know who you truly were. They knew you were American or British or French or Italian, you know, whatever country you were with. But they may not know that you are U.S. Special Forces, you know, you're not British SAS, you're not French Foreign Legion, you know, what Australian SAS, whatever the case may be. So it made it a little harder for the um, Taliban or Al Qaeda or whoever you're facing off against to know who you truly were. So a lot of times you will see people wear what's called a sterile uniform. Uh, it has no insignia. It has no name plates. It has nothing like that. They may have a mixture of weapons and gear because it makes it harder for the enemy to be able to determine who you are. Um, so that's one of the reasons why. And I hope that answers part of the question. And I'd love to hear from you guys as far as what you think is why you think these people wear nondescript civilian type clothing so that answers that question the next topic I wanted to talk to you about was painting your miniatures there's a couple of different thoughts on how to paint your miniatures one is you know it is a tabletop game and you want to make them high contrast. And there's a couple of people out there that do amazing work when it comes to painting your military miniatures. Then you have somebody, i.e. like me, who seems to be more hooked on actuality. So my miniatures are not high in contrast. They actually blend really well into the tabletop. So the, the question I'm posing to you all out there is, how do you prefer to paint your miniatures for gameplay or display. Now, I painted some of the Jungle SAS miniatures from Spectre, and they tend to look a little bit more darker in their camo. It's not, you know, high contrast. Everything seems to blend better together. And I did that purposely because, to me, when you are in the jungle... The jungle is very humid. It can be very damp, so your gear gets wet, and that makes it look darker. Also, part of the reason was is that, like I said, I am come from a military background, so for me, it was harder to make things look like they stand out. I, just out of natural habit, decided they needed to blend in. So that's what I did. Now, looking over on the Facebook page for Spectre Operations, War gaming, you see several different examples of painting of their miniatures. And I have to say that there's one here from Joe McGrath. He's got a couple of it looks like um, desert camo infantry. And um, we're talking the old, this would be 96 ish, the old Desert Storm 1 into two um it's not the old chocolate chip one that would have been 91 but this is the second round so this would have been desert storm two and he does a really nice job of some contrast the, the camo looks nice and clean so what do you guys think do you go for more of the high contrast you know make it stand out on the table do you find yourself falling into what i do and make it look more realistic where it you know it's blending in like it's meant to. So I'd like to hear what you think on that. And what is your favorite type of modern miniature to paint? 
Are you into the multicam? Are you into an old um, MD? Are you into the old Woodland Camo from back in the 80s into 90s before Desert Storm? Are you into just plain greens like you could do like a um, like a SEAL team or a Delta or something that's wearing just, you know, an olive drap type, non-camo? Um, so there's a lot of variations. That's one of the nice things about this genre of miniature painting is you can do just about anything because you have so much to draw from. And because there's so much variety being used by actual modern military forces, you're not really wrong in whatever you decide to do unless you're trying to really model a, an exact unit. Um, you know, if you're doing operational detachment alpha, which is the proper term for an quote unquote a team of the U.S. Special Forces, and you're you're kidding it, you know, like all proper U.S. military issue, then of course you want to go probably with a multi cam or something like that. Or if you're doing, you know, um, an ACU type Ranger Force from, you know, earlier in Afghanistan, you know, whatever the case may be. But, you know, truthfully, nobody's going to judge you on it because there is so much variety and camo painting on miniatures can be very difficult, uh, especially at the smaller scales, 28 mil, 20 mil, 15. So you can't go wrong in anything you do. Now, if you paint them purple or pink, obviously there's going to be some people that raise some eyebrows and may say a word or two. But all in all, when you look at different miniatures, it really, you know, does not really make a difference as far as what you do. So then I know I asked, what is your favorite type of uniform to paint? What is everybody painting these days? Are they going with traditional units? Are they going more of nondescript spec ops, operators, contractors, or enemy forces? Um, it would be interesting to hear what everybody is doing these days. It's nice to see this genre expanding. When I first thought about writing about modern miniature wargaming on the website I write for, there was a little bit of pushback from some members because, oh, it's too soon. You know, we're still fighting. This isn't really something I want to get into, which I totally respect everybody's opinion on that. The thought or question I'm going to pose to you all is, how do you feel about it? Obviously, you're doing gaming or miniature collecting and painting in this genre. But do you feel that it's one of those out-of-bounds taboo subjects? I don't, and this is why I don't feel that way. As I've explained to other people, the reason why I do it is, one, I can associate with it. While I love World War II and my grandparents were in World War II, my grandfathers fought in World War II, and my great-grandmother actually cooked for the army um, and things like that. I don't have a direct association with that era. Love the era. I think it's an incredible era, and there's so much, obviously, history involved in it because you had the whole world trying to fight for survival and defeat some pretty evil people. Now, in our time frame, I have been associated with the military since personally since 1986. My father was in the military and is early as 1975 so I grew up in the military so it's been pretty much part of my life my entire life now my sons and possibly my daughter are in the military uh, my daughter's looking to go into the navy as a nurse so and I have nephews and nieces and cousins and uncles we're a very big military family so to me gaming and collecting and painting miniatures and doing little dioramas and scenes in modern military is something that's personal to me because I can associate with it. I have experience with it. I have friends with it. It's one of those things that I think I can honor by doing this. And that's what I tell people. I said, 
we can learn from what's happened in past events. Now, we don't have to specifically play an exact battle in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria or wherever. You can do a fictional environment, um, a lot of fictional co- you know countries. Uh, Skirmish Sanjin has a uh, supplement out that's based on a fictional African country. Perfectly acceptable. That way they're not pushing any buttons that might make some people upset. They're trying to be respectful for others. I think Spectre Miniatures has done the same thing with Spectre Ops. Theirs is a rule set that lets you play these different organizations and make up your own events and worlds. So they see these events and they're being respectful respectful of it. So there are a lot of people that um, find this era, this genre, to be very interesting because they have people that are living through it and then some people um, have lived through it themselves. I have talked to a few veterans in active duty that are interested in it because they can associate it with it just like I have. And, you know, you talk to Matt Adams from Spectre, he's deep into this. Obviously, he's brought a lot of his experience into this game, his rule set, and his miniatures. So that's why there's so much really good realism in these, Um, you know, and Steven being right there and everybody. So they have done a really good job uh, bringing quality to it. So obviously, like anything else, you're going to have people who are going to be detractors of it. But I think all in all, it's an it's a really good genre. And I think the companies that I have dealt with have done a really good job of being respectful to the personnel that have been involved in these theaters of operation around the world. And obviously, like anything else, some people are just not going to like it. I mean, some people don't like 40K, let's be honest. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. People like 40K, some people don't. Some people can like modern, some people aren't. That's fine, okay? It's The thing about gaming is it allows you to pretty much step outside of your life and go into a life of somebody else or something else and be able to experience an event and then come back to your life, no harm, no foul. So we'd like to hear from you guys and find out why it is that you like modern miniature wargaming and let us know what you think. So other than that, I know there's a a second Sakara movie coming out at the end of this month, end of July of 2018. And it looks very interesting because now that one of the assets they used, the DEA, CIA, used in the first movie has kind of turned or the, the tables have turned and now he's an antagonist in this movie. He's trying to protect an, uh, a girl, a family member or somebody. And obviously there was an operation. She was a witness to it. Government saying can't have any witnesses. You need to eliminate the witness. And the Sicaro, uh, Benicio del Toro's character, is now turned to tables because of his hit past, and he's now protecting this girl, and that puts him up against, you know, the CIA DEA operation. So it's going to be a very interesting movie. I can't wait for it to come out. It'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. I think. Um, you can get a lot of good material for that. I think that's one of the ones that I get a lot of reference material from. Um, one of the campaigns that I'm creating for my jungle SAS guys is because they have a jungle warfare training center in Belize um, that they do a lot of training there that with the drug cartels becoming out of Mexico more than Colombia in those these days. You could have a drug lab deep within the jungles of Belize where Mexican cartels are funneling drugs in and terrorists are bringing money in. And, you know, there's this big 
intermingling of tr- cartels and terrorists. And the British SAS are going, not in my backyard. And so you can play this whole scenario where you've got a group of SAS, a couple teams coming in and trying to take out this lab. So it would make for an interesting table. Um, you know, you can do some jungle work and I think it would make a really interesting table. So that's just one of the scenarios that you can come up with and kind of comes from some of the movies. I've been watching Narcos um, and it's which is interesting because I can tell you from back in the 80s that the DEA had come to brag and was trying to recruit people to go to uh, Central America to help with the uh, drug wars as quote unquote advisors. Um, So it's very interesting. There's a lot of truth behind the fiction to a lot of these games and scenarios that come up with. That's again, that's a nice thing about modern gaming. You're not really stuck in the actual timeline. You can go outside of it to the foggy areas and create your own adventures and your own scenarios and, you know, play a lot of what ifs. And, you know, if I have an SAS team with, you know, ARs and M249s and what have you against guys with just a wide variety of weapons from AKs to FNs, you know, whatever they got their hands on, you would be able to uh, match them up. So, I think that'll do us for this first episode. So we're going to try and keep these to about a half hour or so, uh, at least to begin with. Once we start getting participation and get guests on there, we'll go to about an hour. But I think for the first episode, I think a half hour is pretty good. Uh, Get our feet wet. And eventually we'll start throwing in some video clips and pictures. Um, But really, this is meant for you to just listen to while you're painting or, you know, just background um, when you have an opportunity to for some downtime. So I want to thank you for joining us on this first episode of Sit Rep, your podcast for modern miniatures wargaming. My name's G, and we will catch you on the next one. And as we say, RTB, return to base. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.